Okay, welcome to Teachers Seeking Teachers. It's August 27th, um, 2014, and um, we're continuing the conversation we started last week about Ferguson and um, Michael Brown shooting and our response to it as educators and how we might um, be bringing this to our students and, and beyond. Um, so, Don Reed and I, I, I want to start this way if you don't mind, Don. Don Reed and I have been like playing uh, catch up with each other um, this summer and we said it would be great to have a, um, a show where we can talk about, somebody has the broadcast on. Is that you, Chris? It may be me, let me check, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> We're just barely started, so welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so turn that off and then we won't get to your... Yeah, it sounds like it's off. Good. We can still hear you, is that right? Yeah, okay. So I was I was doing a very personal introduction saying that we were planning to talk about, and we will continue talking tonight about how to launch um, getting our students together because what, um, on youthvoices.net um, where uh, some of us here work um, together and our students uh, talk to each other. One of the things in uh, last week's show um, about Ferguson and um, everything uh, that happened there is that we, we realized how kind of um, homogenous many of, if I could say that, many of our populations are in our schools and or at least how, how, much, how beneficial it would be for us to get them together. So we're not going to lose that thread, we're going to keep that going, but um, we have a lot of people here who can help us think about how and when and uh, to bring these issues with two students, if I could say it that way. And could we do very, very quick um, introductions, um, just saying your name, where you teach and work, and uh, you know, sort of your your thoughts, quick thoughts, first thoughts about um, these issues. And if you don't mind uh, starting us off, Al, um, we'll start alphabetically here. <laughs> Al, did you hear me? He did not. Chris, are you there? I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Well, yeah, Al I'm Chris Emden. Um, I uh, work across a couple of schools across New York City. Um, I teach middle school science and math and also high school science and math uh, at the Science and Medicine Middle School in Brooklyn, New York, and then also Marie Curie High School in the Bronx. And I'm also a faculty member at Teachers College at Columbia. Uh, You're a busy guy, man. How do you do yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I keep pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, and, and so there I, uh, I co-direct the Center for Health Equity and Urban Science Education, um, and I work on a program called Science Genius that brings um, hip-hop to science and math classrooms. And just my, my, my quick take on Ferguson, I wrote a a short piece on uh, on the Huffington Post about it is that you know it's just an absolutely necessary thing to bring to classrooms. Um, the in in the midst of all the dysfunction, um, one of the things that we've been blessed with is that it's a huge, relevant issue that happened at the beginning of the school year, which gives us an opportunity to really have really deep conversation about race, class, inequities, police brutality, etc. Young people um, on an issue that's on their minds and that they're inundated with every day. And so that's just my general take on the topic. Cool. Al, are you there now? Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm there. I think it was... We're doing quick introductions and what you're thinking right now. Oh, okay. All right. Al Elliott, fifth grade educator uh, near Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and the thing that just kind of sticks in my mind through all of this is all of the feelings that I felt about what, what happened in Ferguson. The one feeling that I didn't have was a feeling of surprise. And so I was kind of reminded that, you know, this has kind of been the narrative for, uh, you know, certain populations in this country, period. Uh, there, there, there have always been significant populations of, you know, brown citizens uh, in this country that have had their, uh, let's say, uh, a, a certain type of treatment by, you know, authorities. And, and so that's, that kind of was, was my overall take, is that I, I was surprised that I didn't feel surprised. Let me, let me say that. It was kind of like I felt a lot of things, anger, upsetness, but at no point was I like, wow, I can't believe it. And now you're, you're a father as well, is that correct? Yes, I'm a father to a, a, a sophomore uh, in high school, and, and, and I'm starting to have a lot of the same conversations that my mother had with me 
about how you interact with the police if you happen to be pulled up. He's taking drivers in, and there's just certain realities uh, when you learn to drive in Alabama. That I'm sh and not just in Alabama, as we see, it's 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 a countrywide uh, problem. But there's just certain realities that you have to, I mean, go over with black men in this country, and it's it's unfortunate, but but it is real. Chris Sloan, sorry. Yeah, we've got a lot of Chris's here tonight. Right, so. we do include uh, <laughs> this is the good. Chris show. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City. And you know, predominantly my students uh, are Caucasian, but we do have uh, the class that we've had some really good conversations in is uh, you know about half students of color, and um, everybody's been really interested in talking about race. Um, one of the Caucasian students today made a point about you know we don't talk about it enough in general, and and definitely not um, enough in school. So we had some really good talks today um, and yesterday. It's a media class, so they went and interviewed other students around the school for their take, too. Um, so, really fascinating talks. And Mr. Rogers, Christopher Rogers. Oh, yeah, I like how you switched it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> everybody, um, so I'm a pre-K through 8 librarian and technology coordinator at Green Street Friends in Germantown section of Philadelphia. Um, I guess uh, sort of taking back, taking the situation into... I think the, the big thing for me is this uh, sort of dual way of understanding the Ferguson as it affects sort of like I'd say our community. And when I say our community, I'm thinking of uh, sort of like my hometown of Chester, which is a majority African-American city, and then how it affects the American community, you know, and um, sort of how to focus on how to have a conversation that really brings everyone into the same accord so we can talk about police brutality uh, militarization of police, we can talk about racial conflict, we can talk about constitutional rights, we can talk about all these different pieces that are a part of it in a way where it doesn't just become a black issue but an American issue. Right. And um, trying to sort of piece that out while at the same time knowing the sort of singular pain and burden that is on black and uh, brown children it has been sort of like the way of sort of, I'm trying to figure out how to balance that. So reading a lot of the articles and that Ferguson syllabus really helps out, and um, just really taking it in. Cool. I there was so much I want to come back to you on, and I know this too. Let's kick go with the rest of the introductions. So Don, welcome. <laughs> Don Reed. Hi, I'm Don Reed. I teach high school English in Okemish, Michigan. We don't actually start till next week. And I mostly teach freshmen and juniors. And I'm very excited about learning from everyone. I watched the uh, TTT from last week and was really inspired by this call to allow students to embrace the challenges and questions in the world around them and to deal with um, current events and to be driven by what's going on in society. And um, I've been thinking a lot about that in terms of like, how we place the groundwork for establishing classroom communities in order to have some really tough conversations. And I know that there was a call to think about it like on the first day. And, and so I've been thinking about how do we move up conversations that might typically happen later on in the year in order to, to accommodate some of the world issues that are going on, such as Ferguson. Great. And Deborah, Deborah Rogers from St. Louis. Hello. Welcome. I'm Deborah. Um, I teach in St. Louis Public Schools. I teach at a middle school. Um, my kids were featured on Huffington Post last week. Um, their writing was featured when they were doing Ferguson Reflections, basically. Um, we're right next door to Ferguson, so our students were all in school, um, but had just tons of basic logistical problems getting to school, um, just because of the protests and the violent protests at night and um, getting buses down the streets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my kids have been kind of struggling through how to deal with this. Um, we're predominantly African-American uh, school, and um, I think they're basically just really angry and confused and just very emotional in general, and then they're kids. Um, so nobody really wants to listen to what they have to say, which is infuriating for me, obviously, because 
I'm all about getting kids' voices heard. So um, we had a week of reflection in our second week of school, and uh, it went really, really well. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk to y'all and just hear about, you know, what you guys are thinking and um, how you guys are going to address it with your kids and just more ways to get students to talk and then to let them feel heard, not just to speak out loud, but to actually feel like somebody's affirming what they say. Well, thanks for joining us. Joanna. Joe. Joanna, are you my mom, Paul? No, um, <laughs> hi, uh, Joe. Uh, I teach in East Oakland, um, and I've, I teach primarily, well, this year I teach all seniors. Um, we will be talking about Ferguson tomorrow as we introduce our senior research project, and uh, basically looking, and we're very, I mean, we're right three blocks down from the Fruitvale where um, Oscar Grant was killed. So the tie into that runs very deep for our kiddos, and um, we're bringing it up tomorrow. I guess we'll talk about how we're bringing it up, but but I think it's going to be an excellent intro into the research theme of social equity and what it just means about issues of fairness and and conversations about choosing research topics that make your belly burn and your heart beat faster. Um, this one this one will resonate with the kids. So anything any issues with police in Oakland, the kids will yeah. They can have a discussion about it. So. Sam Reed the third. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, yeah. I'm um, Sam. Uh, I teach uh, young people to read, write, and make sense of the world. Um, I'm going to be starting up a new school, starting at a new school, the U School. And interestingly, today we uh, we were doing some professional development around restorative practices. And I think our first day of school, with respect to Ferguson or anything, is like forming a circle and, and honoring kids, you know, honoring uh, their perspectives, their voice, and obviously um, the issue around Ferguson is going to come up. But the other thing that we talked about in our black male teacher meetup group is, I mean, we're putting some of the onus on kids, but a lot of it is like on us as adults, like how we see and how we humanize or how we uh, look at kids in terms of the, the narration of uh, what we what we look at kids at, and I, so I, I think we need to do some some deep digging uh, and reflecting ourselves as educators, not just African American educators, but educators across the spectrum. Cool. And I'm Paul Allison, and I teach at a new school, second year of the school, um, New Direction Secondary School. And this week, I've been working with uh, young teachers, uh, Teach for America teachers, who are joining our staff, and. Um, there's so much to get to, right? Um, but we had like 10 minutes to talk about uh, whatever else we wanted to talk about, and I brought up Ferguson, and there was like a sigh of relief in the room, like, oh, I didn't think we'd ever talk about this. So, you know, it's um, just, uh, it was it was great to then, you know, that went much more than 10 minutes after that. So that's uh, my first thought. Um, Chris Lehman, you joined us. Welcome. I did. Uh, I'm not sure I can be here for all that long, unfortunately, uh, but I wanted to at least hop in. So, Thank you. hello. Yeah. So what's it like being a principal thinking about this? <laughs> You're much more than that. But, um, <laughs> but, that, but uh, uh, it's challenging. It's funny because we've been talking, you know, our kids come back on the 8th, and we've been talking about what do we want to do as far as is sort of school-wide... Um, conversation and what we have been, what we sort of always look at is do we, you know, SLA teachers tend to be um, on the more radical educator side of things and so what we caution ourselves on is making sure that we're having the conversation that the kids need to have, not the conversation we want the kids to need to have. And so um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about in PD next week in our diversity and multiculturalism uh, workshop is how do we create the space for the conversation to happen without forcing it. And it is okay if a group of 20 kids in an advisory, for example, say, this isn't the thing we want to talk about. This is, we, you know, like, yes, we know this. Yes, we've been here. Yes, we've had this conversation. But we, this isn't the thing we want to talk about while also honoring the fact that other kids may want to talk about it. So we've talked about sort of doing a um, 
like within our advisories doing gallery walks of issues that were important to us this summer and opening it up to a larger question, letting the issues of Mike Brown's uh, shooting, letting the issues of what's gone on in Ferguson happen organically if they are there to happen and then working on the strategies of if they are there, and we think they will be in many cases, how do we have that conversation responsibly? How do we have that conversation in a way that puts the kids voices at the center in the front of that conversation and um, so that's been kind of how we've been looking at how do we how do we ensure that we are the adults the kids need us to be um, in this context um, and not either force an issue like we're gonna talk about this now and yet da and certainly not as you know not shy away from an issue as well but I, you know we're almost more concerned with that I think all of us are struggling with it, frustrated, angry, upset, and you know the worst thing that you could do is you know um, make the kids your therapy session, right? And have the conversation that you want to have as an educator about it, but rather making sure you're the person the kids need to need you to be. Wow. So there's a lot there. Jump in, guys. I... Yeah, you know the challenge. The challenge that I that I that I've sort of been struck with, what I've been thinking about really deeply. Um, it's sort of aligned to what Chris was talking about in Which that Chris, you don't want Chris, Chris, Chris Lehman, Chris Lehman. Yeah, right? Okay. Um, okay. And, and that you don't want you don't want to, you know, it's very very easy for us to be able to layer our conversations with young people with our own political leanings, right? Um, and with with our own sort of general like you know how embedded we are in the issue. And and for me, for example, I'm coming to Mike Brown and Ferguson having had an interaction with the New York Police Department a couple weeks ago that I shared broadly on my Facebook. And so whenever I come to the case, I'm coming with my own personal beliefs. And, and so the, it, it's, a, it's a very, very delicate space to be able to interrogate with young people. And that's why I always make the argument for, um, you know, you, you can't ever go wrong with a KWL, right? Because, you know, when you start off with something that broad and something sort of apolitical like that, you're allowing young people to share what their perceptions are. And, you know, I always... I always do my KWLs with an F also, you know, like, what do you know, what do you want to know, what have you learned, and how do you feel? And so when you, when you layer this piece of just facts as well as their emotions, then you have a wide swath of things that you can pull from. And when you do that, then your lessons can go any and everywhere. And, you know, it's not about you sharing how you feel per se. It's about you interrogating all the things that they've mentioned. Well, let me ask you a question. Like, and you mentioned, like, like, do you find yourself purposely excluding how you may feel, or do you try to make sure that it's okay that if you share how you feel and it's opposite, like what the kids feel, that it's a safe enough space for them to disagree with you or, or agree with you, or do you just say, you know what, how I feel is not important in this discussion? You know, I, I, I think you, you know your positioning as my positioning for you know I'll speak about my so my positioning as a, as a person of color you know, who who has bared the brunt of those practices will inevitably emerge. Right. Um, but I always try my absolute best to extract that from the conversation, as challenging as that may be, and as antithetical to what my political leanings may be, I know for the sake of doing what's best for my kids, I've got to sort of take that out. Um, and then over the course of the conversation, because it'll that. emerge, because <laughs> it can't not emerge. You right. know what I mean? Like, so it's not going to not happen. So I'm very, very explicit about extracting it from the beginning. Right. Um, and, and then if there are places where, uh, you know, a child, a student says something, I can say, I can understand how you feel because I've had this experience. Right. Um, but it's never about guiding with my narrative or guiding with my political leaning. Right. Um, because anybody who knows me outside of the classroom knows what those are. <laughs> right. And given, you know, and for me, given how many of the kids follow me on Twitter or follow me on Facebook or read my blog, uh, well, most of the kids know where I stand politically. Um, or, or saw what you and the school did around Jordan Davis or that's you know, right. Martin. Exactly. Or, so, so, like, yeah. Right. So, but I think the important thing is this, which is that you know, back when I was in the classroom, I used to say when these conversations, you know, I would say, you know, this is Lehman's world, no option to buy, and you know, like when I was expressing what were my opinions, and now I think actually it's an interesting thing because now when I talk about this stuff, you know, for me, I say, look, I'm the white Jewish principal of a diverse school. I've lived, you know. And I've listened to students tell me these things, right? So, like, for me, it's actually kind of an interesting moment because I'm able to say, 
how being the teacher of an amazing of an amazingly diverse community, you know, or the educate principal, whatever, has influenced where I am today. Right? So on some level that is almost the invitation to the kids and and I will actually not on some level, I make that explicit. Like that is the invitation to the kids of like why I think the way I think is because in large part because of the listening I have done to the other kids who have sat in your seats right now. So by all means, create that space for me to hear you. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm here to hear you. Know, like, and, and this is a space for me to hear you. And I think that's important. I think kids are, um, kids are excited by the prospect that their ideas and their experiences and their lives impact the way their teachers think. I think that's a really powerful thing. We Deborah. actually had Good. so Go yeah. we had two um, two considerations when we dealt with the emotional side of the Ferguson discussion and whether the teachers should really input their decision. Um, our biggest problem was that it was the second week of school, so we don't know our students yet, and they don't know us. And we have a very diverse teaching staff, so um, it was you know quite problematic for, I mean, for me, a white teacher who does not have a relationship with her students yet to deal with a race issue right off the bat um, before I even knew their names. That's you know a really big consideration wow. before delving into that kind of conversation. Um, but we just decided that it was too important to not deal with it. So the way I approached it was um, I kind of I let them have their conversation and then specifically I mean every single class I taught for days on end I have 187 students this year, and every single class asked me what I thought. Like, not just, oh, like, hey, what do you think, Miss Rogers? Like, I mean, to the point, each discussion question, it would come back around, and they would ask me, well, what do you think? And why do you think that? And what are your experiences? Um, and, you know, te the kids would ask me or say, like, well, I don't know if I should say this out loud because, you know, you're... Why? And they would like hesitate in this adorable kid way. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like this is that's what we're all about. Like say it, just say it out loud. Um, and we would get to the heart of the matter. But I mean, they were really uncomfortable with it at first. And then once we kind of like broke through, then and like I shared some of my opinions, then they felt a lot more comfortable sharing theirs. Um, and it was it was really interesting. They were very honest, and they were also very curious. And I also deal with younger students, so I have 7th and 8th graders, so I think a lot of y'all are high school, so um, just kind of, I don't know, a younger kid needs a teacher to sometimes come in with an opinion every now and then. Um, we've got of some 5th and 6th grade here, too, by the way, so yeah, oh, okay. we're, we're with you here. <laughs> um, I have yeah. a question for Deborah, though. Um, yes, sir. So, like, um, you know, I heard that there was the, uh, the superintendent in Edwardsville, Illinois, said, like, you know, don't talk <laughs> about this issue. And you just said it sounds like everything was really healthy, like with you. Were there like what were the bumps in the road though? Because there had to have been some mm -hmm. things that, that weren't so easy, right? Yes, I think our biggest bumps in the road were discovering how racist our staff is. <laughs> to be honest, I mean we had plenty of teachers who are of every color, of every background, of every socioeconomic status, who had very interesting opinions. Um, and our principal had to kind of lead a professional development with us, um, kind of impromptu. I don't think she was expecting to have to have these conversations. Um, just about, you know, we had a teacher make a comment that, you know, she she felt like she couldn't have these conversations with students because she doesn't know all the facts about Mike Brown, and, you know, maybe it was justified. Maybe the shooting was justified. That was her comment to the staff, and I mean, oh my God, everybody that flipped out. That was the principal's out. comment? Yeah. No, no, no. This was another well, teacher. So I my missed principal. That. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay. Well, we need to obviously address this right this second because you can't lead a discussion with fourteen-year-olds if you're going to say maybe the shooting of this unarmed kid was justified. Like that's. And you know, this is why um this is why I I advocate for and and when we start classes in a couple of weeks, I make the argument for the extraction of personal opinion from the presentation of the cases. You know, what happens with this? Because, look, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the teacher bringing their full self to the classroom. Um, I think when you're talking about a case like this, oftentimes when a teacher... Oh, no. Oops. <laughs> I wow. really didn't hear what he was going to say there. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 definitely on the edge of my seat. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Somebody I, I want to keep agree. going with I, that though? Well, yeah, I agree with what he's saying. I mean, the the extraction of a personal opinion, I mean, it does take out the the potential for these kind of explosive conversations to happen where you just have the potential of making kids even angrier. And, I mean, my students are really angry about everything, and, and they should be, and, and they can be. So to take out your personal opinion then does leave a lot more space for the kids to explain and express themselves, and that's far more important than the teacher making this a teachable moment. I mean, this is much more about expression than about... And, and that's exactly know. where I was going. Because, you know, oftentimes <laughs> also, a teacher... I, I'm sorry, I, I jumped out and jumped back in. I don't know what happened to my server. No, no, you're good. You're um, good. We're you're waiting good. on you. But, but, but you know, the, when, the, when, the, when oftentimes you will find that a teacher who may have these perceptions of the case, which is based on whatever media they subscribe to, right? You know, it's like, you know, if you're watching friggin' Fox all day, you're going to have a certain perception of the case even if your humanity leads you another way. And I think when you bring this information to teachers or your colleagues in a way that says present the, present the case, present the facts, present the media from multiple perspectives to the young people and have them share what they know in their perspectives, sometimes a teacher who may have a flawed belief is challenged by the overwhelming response of the young people. So sometimes when a teacher's political leanings lean them in a way that's flawed, and they have to fight against the humanity of the young people and the emotion of the young people and the effects it has on them, it helps them to shift where they, how they come to the, to the, to the discussion. Um, and, and that's why I always err in a favor of check you at the door just a tad. Let them give you what they believe because it might help to challenge you to shift your belief system or affirm you in yours. But then, you know what, like, a, a lot of times, and, and this is something that, that I find when I talk to people that hold, a, I guess, a a different belief than me in a certain area and, and I know I'm right or, or whatever, however that may be, right, however that may be, they genuinely are so unaware of their misconceptions, like entirely. Like I've had conversations with people and their, their entire conversation is based on their belief in honesty of law enforcement, cash blanche, like period. Like if the police officer said da 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 da, then this is what happened. And so a lot of times if that's where their 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 logic is based in, then it's, it's, it's almost impossible to have a conversation like this when there are about a thousand other conversations and realizations that need to happen with a certain facilitator of a discussion. Like there are some people that genuinely don't know of this world that we live in. Like they, they have lived in, in this cocoon of sorts of realities where – their reality for them is exactly like they're used to, you know, the police officer always giving them warnings. They're used to, uh, you know, the court always, you know, a smile, a wink, and a nod. You, 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 can, you, know, you can miss this, you can miss that. And so there are certain things that they genuinely don't believe are possible, you know. I agree. Yeah, so um, I wanted to come back and talk about the structure. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. The structures uh, that I think are important to have these conversations, and I, and I think Chris Lehman was talking about like what happens at SLA and, and, and advisories, uh, like creating these safe spaces, these uh, community hubs where kids circle up and have conversations. Um, and again, this whole thing about around building trust, because as um, as someone else said earlier, if if you if we don't have trust, it's going to be hard for you to like engage in these like real heartful conversations. Right. And, and again, I think we need to have these structures for kids, but also think we need to have these structures for adults. Right. And in fact, maybe the adults should have the circle before we have the kids in circles. Definitely. So I was, I'm like really grateful this week we're, we're, we're doing um, PD and like I said, we're doing this restorative practice, but I'm looking at restorative practice as a, as a means and as, as a lens to like lead into this conversation because if, just imagine if police officers had to undergo restorative practice and they internalized it, and then when they faced, you know, Michael Brown, they would have seen some humanity in this kid instead of seeing him as whatever whatever the officer saw him as. Right? You because hope. If you see humanity in a person, you're not going to shoot first and ask questions later. You're going to be like, you know what, that's my kid. So anyway, struck. De Deborah, is that is, what happened in your staff after the principal said we got to talk about this? After she talked about after she the nasty comment or yeah, just yeah yeah ah, yes. 
Um, we actually we did exactly what we were just talking about. I think Sam just mentioned that. Um, we circled up and had a pretty honest and brutal conversation about um, just kind of what happened, why it's a big deal, and then we talked about race, I mean, for a good two hours, just race and what it means to have white privilege, um, what it means to be black in America, what it means to raise wow. black children and black men um, specifically. I had a, We had a staff member cry talking about raising her son and being genuinely scared. Um, so we had a very honest conversation first, and then we came up with a plan of how to address it with our students. So we talked about um, structure, like Sam was asking about, um, you know, what are we going to do? Are we? Is this in advisory? Is this in class? Is this in particular teachers' classrooms? Um, and I think the staff had to come together and really figure out what was what worked with our school and what worked with the student population that we had last year and what we knew was, you know, coming into school this year. Um, we came up with a structure for advisory classes for a week-long reflection that would then just an advisory morning block for like 45 minutes um, where we did the KWL chart where we talked where we read articles we listened to podcasts we um, watched a video we did a bunch of things together and then the that work was carried out in the English classrooms um, where we're actually reading books I it's kind of perfect timing actually about um, just we were reading Copper Sun, Monster, um, and a, I think another book, another teacher's teaching another book about an African-American teenager who kind of deals with the same kind of nonsense. So it was a really good fit for our school to carry out the conversation in our English classes. So we just continued it and spent an entire week just all classes were just devoted to talking, 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 and thinking, and writing, and you know just discussing and continuing the conversation. So we tried to give like a pretty structured time for part of the day and then a very unstructured time for part of the day just to give all teachers and all freedom and all students the freedom to explore what they were actually thinking and feeling. Um, and to actually, you know, I think that um, one of the Chris's was saying um, about how to, you know, give people the opportunity to say, I don't really want to talk about this, like this isn't important to me. That's Chris or, Lehman, by the way. Go ahead, yeah. Chris Lehman, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Um, so to just give them the opportunity to kind of say, like, this, is a, this just really isn't, like, I don't really get this. Um, and we do have a lot of students who live on the south side of the city, which is miles away from Ferguson. Like some of them had never even heard of Ferguson. So to them, it was basically another city. So they had no idea. Whereas other, some of my students live literally right next door and could go to a Ferguson school if they wanted to. So I mean, it was just kind of all over the place, and we had to give them some kind of structured way to either deal with it if they wanted to, or not deal with it, or just listen. So for us, it was very much like a school-based decision. I think that's probably what needs to happen in most schools. Just figure out what works with your student population, and then what is your staff actually capable of? Because, I mean, some of my teachers are like, hell no, they can't have that conversation. I mean, no. For God's sake, no. Get somebody else in that room, or give those students to somebody else. So. Can, I, can, I, can I pose a question to the, to the group? I'm just curious, because I, I'm, I'm hoping that people will watch this and kind of take something away from it, but I'm sure some people watching this is asking, why would I want to have a conversation? Like, what do you think the result of having the Ferguson conversation in with, with kids is? Like, what's the real purpose of doing it? Like, are the kids improved? Or is, is the school the scholastically will test scores go up? Is that the point? Like and, and again I'm I'm it's kind of tongue in cheek, but I would love to hear the perspective. I know what I think, but but I I would like to hear Well what do you, know, you think? Go ahead, say more. I think that it, it is ultimately important um, for kids to know that they are important and what they think is important. And I think if we never give them an opportunity, like for example, kids know that we think math is important because we make them do it. Well, they know that writing is important because we make them do it. But if every time they have, they want to have a conversation about the, something they think is important, it's after school, it's outside of school, it's a homework assignment, then they figure out pretty quickly what you think of their importance, right? And so I, I think it's important with the whole trust building issue, uh, the being able to articulate your voice about a, a difficult topic or a difficult subject. Uh, it, it's funny because I'm, I'm made fun of at my school a lot of times. Because teachers always see me in the hallway with kids. Like, I don't put them out. The kids take me in the hallway because they want to talk to me about something. And most of the time, it's really not a big deal. But my philosophy is if they feel comfortable enough coming to me 
for something that isn't a big deal when something is a big deal they will also feel comfortable coming to me and talking to me so I think the value in is in actually kids being able to articulate themselves and express uh, a viewpoint uh, in, of something that's happening in the world is real and shown that the institution that they come to every day also values that to me that's the importance and so, I, I would I would say um, well, Chris will hear more. Go, go, go ahead, Chris. The okay, other Chris. Chris, Chris, Chris yeah. Rogers, go ahead. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, um, I was going to say, I think uh, one, one of my goals is uh, pretty young in my educational career, but really um, what, I, what I sort of strive through from a library and resource is to how, how do we create, how do we make this conversation sort of like an everyday practice where we talk about the um, sort of like individual and um, sort of social a means of racism and sort of discrimination um, across all sort of isms and then how do we talk about systemic ways in which um, sort of systems and structures and the his the history of this in a, in a way that cuts across all subjects in a way that cuts across all disciplines and um, trying to figure out a way to sort of so that it's not always a sort of um, you have a moment I think um, teacher from Oakland talked about the Oscar Grant uh, situation and we had the moment there. There was the Jordan Davis sort of moment. But how do we begin to take this sort of like genealogy of all these moments which are happening? Now you mentioned like this is really no surprise at this moment. How do we begin to take all these and, and say at a point that how do we create a curriculum that rep that represents and has this already involved in it as an everyday practice, as normalized and not as sort of um, reactive conversation but more proactive conversation. Right. So for, for me in the library it's like being able to curate resources and things that sort of speak to that. A few I'm people wanted to talk. Go ahead, Jeff. Brilliantly articulated, and I think, and I think, you know, I think, and this is what I was trying to sort of get at earlier is that you know when we what 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 Ferguson allows us to do is to open up the space for a dialogue that under normal circumstances we wouldn't have at all because it's such an issue. That is like in the, it's the same. Just like just like Trayvon Davis allowed us to sort of rally around an issue, right? Like what Ferguson allows us to do, what Michael Brown allows us to do in this instance is it allows us to begin having a conversation about these long, deep-seated issues that folks would not consider otherwise, right? Because it's in front of your face across social media and media at large, then we can have the conversation. But these conversations should be happening anyway. And and just to reiterate what your point is, and, and maybe extend it a bit. There's a misperception that this conversation should be in schools in advisory or that it should be in schools in the beginning of the school year because it's a big thing. But I make the argument that you know every teacher across subject areas can find points of intersection between these issues and their content. Listen, I'm a science dude, right? So as you know, as a science person who's teaching a science course, if I can have a conversation about the ecology of the environment and tie that into how that might have happened. Um, that anyone can, any social studies class can, any math class can, and not in a way that's like you know, you know, or you know, uh, the, the slavery math problems, you know, you know, because you know some fool somewhere is gonna say, you know, what was the trajectory of the bullets? I'm not talking about that stupidity, um, or, but I'm talking about the, this idea the chemistry of, of the tear gas, frankly. Yeah, so, ahead, you know, yeah. being really <laughs> creative about how you create some connectedness mm -hmm. across your subject area, so that you're not just teaching to teach the content, but you're teaching. For humanity, and you're teaching hu the content through humanity, through right. emotion, through feeling, and um, you know, and, and and I think that everybody can do that. Like I really firmly believe that every teacher can do that if you have a principal like like Chris Lehman, um, who who creates the space for us to have those conversations and pushes the entire school staff to think about their content in a more creative way. Can you know, I, like can one I push thing that I loved when I visited, and I didn't even see the school in action. I just met, I just got a chance to meet some of his kids. Um, was the fact that each of so there was this physics kid, I, I can't remember his young his, his name, Chris. Do you remember his name? Uh, who you met? I I, I, I met <laughs> African American young man loved physics to the core. But you're having conversations with this young man, and he's talking about physics with the same type of enthusiasm and creativity as he's having conversations about race and class in America. I mean, that is what we want, right? Um, and, and that's the penultimate goal. So that when Ferguson dies down, and 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 we're laying in wait. Till the next one happens, we we're not we're still having these conversations. So when the next event happens, right. you have kids who are social politically aware and right. can deal with it in a proactive way. 
Right. Why? And that gets to this question of why do we, right, and that gets to the question of, you know, an inquiry-driven education where that notion of what are the questions we can ask cross all disciplines, right? This is this idea of a school-wide pedagogical approach that, number one, engages kids in asking powerful questions, number two, demands that school is authentic work, that we are asking kids to do real work that matters now, not telling them the big lie of this is good for you someday, right? Because wow. if we go back to the this is good for you someday, then we don't need to talk about Ferguson. We don't need to talk about any of this stuff. We're going to talk about the fact because somebody in this room might major in a subject someday that you we're going to study right now. But if we say school is about the human beings we all are right now and how each day we spend together should help us become the best versions of ourselves that we can be right now, all of us, students and teachers alike, then these things that are coming, these events, these moments, that the world we live in is not isolated, or the school is not isolated from the world we live in. And the world we live in faces issues of racism, classism, sexism, homophobia. The world we live in faces issues of economic justice and social justice and environmental justice. The world we live in is one that we are trying to make a more equitable you know, place. And when we say it's about right now, and when we also, there's another nuance to this, which is when we say the purpose of school is not so you can go get a job someday and this individualistic notion of you're going to school because it's good for you, but school exists for all of us. School exists because we need as a society you, the student, to be the best person you can be because, oh my goodness, this world is a complex and challenging place and you got to help make it better. Then... All of these issues demand a space in what we do. And now history, we study history not so we can memorize a bunch of dates, but so we can make sense of the, past, of the present and make the future better. We read texts to analyze the world. We study science so we can make informed decisions as citizens of the world that have a science when we need to apply a scientific lens of the world. All of these things, all of these subjects become, you know, um, fertile ground for the conversations of how do we cure what ails us. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole school approach. And that's got to permeate everything. And the one thing that I will push back a little bit on what uh, my dear colleague Dr. Edmund said is that it's not about it's not about isolating it in advisory when we have the conversations in advisory. It's about using advisory as that safest place we have to begin the conversations so kids know that it can then bleed into everything else that we do. Um, you know, it's, I think there are some schools where it's like, oh, we'll deal with it in advisory because that way it doesn't distract us from the curriculum. Well, those schools don't understand what advisory is really about. Mm -hmm. Advisory is the place where things, where kids have the safest space to begin the conversations and to know that those conversations can then branch and grow and move into everywhere else. Um, you know, and that's, so that's my one and I think it depends on how your school looks at advisory. For us, advisory is the core and soul of everything we do. So, of course, something as big as this is going to be in the advisory because that's the soul of our school. And this, what's going on in Ferguson is hitting all of us in our souls. Hey, can, can, I, can I veggie back off of uh, Chris Lehman? Go for it, Sam. Yeah, so at our, at our school, uh, we're calling advisory, we're calling it a posse. And it's also this time, the sacred space. Uh, where we're bringing young people together for these like real-world circles and conversations, but also the veggie back in terms of the curriculum. Like uh, anyway, I'm, I'm Chris Lehman. I'm like super excited. I'm in a new school. Like I'm <laughs> going to be. I'm going to be showing off a little bit. But we're going to be solving like real-world problems. We call we, this summer. We 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 identify what we call like wicked problems, and then we're going to have kids in spaces. We're going to have like. Uh, a building space where they're making things to solve these problems. They're going to be in a highlight lab that I'm going to be uh, leading where we're uh, using media and media focus to, to solve like these real world problems. And then we have an organizing space where they're going to be organizing. So again, if the kids feel this issue around race is the issue that they want to take up, boom. Okay, how can you build something? How can you uh, highlight it? How can you organize? Or maybe it's not race. Maybe it's sexism. But again, they'll they'll drive it. But obviously, some kids are going to feel race is going to be an issue, you know, dear and near to them, and that's going to be an issue that they're going to want to tackle. 
and we're going to again have the structures in place to uh, set it up. So I think it's Sam, really important. Sam, who are your students? So we're, we're open enrollment school. Our kids are 50% uh, of them are coming from the neighborhood where the school is locate, located. It's in North Philadelphia. And the other 50% are um, coming from all over the city. We'll be taking like ninth, we'll be starting at ninth grade, building a school like, you know, building it like uh, like Lehman. They were just starting up a, a, a school um, in, at my old school uh, plant at the Bieber Middle School. And so the, we're going to be going through that process. So um, I'll be coming over, Chris, taking some notes and stuff like that. Deal. So on the advisory, um, I just wanted to share, uh, I, I, I did bring up Ferguson with the uh, people who are coordinating advisory at my school, and they said, yeah, advisory is a good, great place. So for this conversation, I didn't follow up, I would now, with, yeah, and how do you think that's going to come into the other classes? Um, because the conversation ended right there, right? Like, okay, we've got a, we, we, you don't have to deal with that, Paul. We've got, yep. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about this in advisory, don't worry about it, right? So, so that was a helpful comment, Chris Lehman. Thank you for that. Thanks. But, yeah. <laughs> um, I, wa I wanted to open it up for Joe and Don. Uh, you guys have been quiet over there. Or I was right about to say that. I need to find yeah. out what the heck is going on in Oakland. <laughs> oh, many, many things. Um, I, I just want to appreciate all the thoughts that have been said. I mean, unfortunately, it's sad and it's ironic that this hits so close to home in terms of a high-profile case, uh, which speaks to what Al was saying about being surprised and not being surprised. And so I think that given the context of where I'm teaching, um, we, I, I frame it that way because we do base our entire our entire year's theme on social equity, and we, we teach in you terms of how do you... history there in Oakland, got, too, right? I mean... We, we got, we got yeah. more than our fair share of history. Um, <laughs> and so we teach it in a way that's like, we use literary theory. Like, we, we try to frame it so that they can analyze systems, they can analyze anything, and look at it from all these different lenses, whether it be post-colonialism or, or a Marxist lens or a feminist lens. And so part of, I guess, keeping it... The word's not comfortable, but keeping it a space where the dialogue can keep going for everybody is, is, is putting some objectivity to the intense emotion. And I feel that even for my own self as a woman of color, and I am raising two, two sons of color both in high school right now, it just it, it, it does something for me to be able to frame it using theory lenses and, and saying, you know, kids, when we look at it from the feminist perspective or the Marxist perspective, what is this all telling us? And having the kids be able to frame questions using that, it, it kind of, they can have that emotion and that, and that but they, there's, there's language around it now that they can use to be able to talk about it. And so when we engage in this dialogue tomorrow, I mean, this is our whole class discussion, is taking the case of Ferguson and, and taking the case of Oscar Grant and using that to talk about when you, when you want to have a senior, they, they work on these senior projects all year long, but it has to be on a topic based in social equity, so an issue of unfairness where um, they want to solve it also. And so part of being able to have that discussion with them is bringing up things that are very current. And, and sadly, this is so current and it's so fresh for them, but it comes right on the heels of Oscar Grant. And, and it's a norm for our students. So how do you talk about it in a way that gets them to, they're, they're jaded almost. It's, it's like no one's talking about it. Um, and and it's, it makes me sad, I think, because they just, they're like, oh, well, Oscar Grant, or, oh, well, Michael Brown. And it, that's, to me, just, it's horrible. What, what do you mean no one's talking about it? That you, when, when, when we had, when Oscar Grant was shot, mm -hmm. we had students talking about it immediately. And, and it was fodder in our class. Like, we were have, be able to have discussions. And I guess I'm, I'm coming, I have 12th graders, and so they're the same age as, as Michael Brown. And, and, it's, and, and, and with, when it came to Oscar Grant, the way that they were talking about it was because of how they had been stopped by the police. I have too many kids that have been stopped by the police, I mean, multiple times and who fear for their lives now. And then they were talking about it, and it was fearful for them to think about well, that just happened so close to home, and it could it's going to happen to me. Like, they already have a very limited uh, timeline in their lives about how long they think they're going to survive. 
And but now, I mean, we're engaging in the conversation tomorrow. But there has there has not been. I haven't. You know, usually I can ear hustle on different conversations with the kids, and it's it's not what they're talking about here. And and, I, and I'm wondering. Down, you got to break down ear hustle with me here. Oh, uh, I listen in on conversations surreptitiously without uh, them knowing. Okay, okay. gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay. So I, I am kind of excited to see what happens because when, when we have it, and we're filming it tomorrow in, in, and not like in their face filming it, but I, I, want them, I want them to see what it means to also have a discussion about real topics. Um, but they, I, I am blessed. I have seniors, and so I, I feel like in terms of age, I don't even know where I I would go with it with middle school or fifth grader no, I, that is doing that work with much younger students. Um, but with my seniors, you know, it's it's we want it. We want them to form a topic that does, does that does make their heart beat faster that they are passionate about. And I feel like this is one. This is my in um, talking about this case and talking about that both shootings. Uh, it, it's going to actually be a way that I can give an example of a topic they could. Talk about in their senior projects. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm finding my my comfort zone with it by one bringing up my. I think there's part of you can bring up that personal opinion, but I'm doing it in a way that's like I am. I'm raising my own sons, and they are both dark skinned children, and I worry for them every day. Um, and coming at them with that personal we, connection. You'll say that to your students. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, they 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 they've seen my kids. So, mm. but. But I'm coming from that mom perspective about why I think it's important to talk about it. But I'm not, I, I, and I have very deep opinions about it. But letting the kids, using the lenses, like frame, frame their questions about the case and then trying to answer those questions. And then I can, I'm pretty sure that there will be a bunch of students that are going to choose policing issues, um, different, you know, different policing issues. Especially well, they did local. last year already, right? Oh, my I mean, God, so yeah. But, the, yeah, yeah, they did. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, we've had these conversations at SLA a lot, and, you know, I think on some level you're right. I think one thing that's really interesting is is that I almost feel sometimes there's fatigue, like where the kids are like, yes, of course this happens. We know this happens. We we wow. live here. Like, wow. you know, and I think that that's, so I, I hear that. The other thing that I found really interesting is that, you know, and I, is that the conversation, you know, some of the early conversations we have with some of the kids who were in over the summertime We've got some summer programs we run. Is how nuanced this conversation has to be, and why again to go to actually echo something that Chris was saying earlier, Chris Emden, about um, not to put you know or to make sure that your beliefs or your thoughts do not shut down other thoughts. Right. Is you know it'd be really easy you know for an SLA teacher for me to come in and say like this was horrible and wrong, blah, 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 the cops and too much power and too much this and too much that. But we have kids who are like, look, we think this is you know like one of the conversations I had this summer with a student who lives in one of the really tough, you know, to grow up neighborhoods in Philadelphia is, you know, she said, look, I said, she said, I can recognize, I know that this was bad, I know this is wrong, but it's bothering me that everybody's running down the cops because, like, my neighborhood doesn't feel safe to me and the cops, as much as I know there's a problem, keep my neighborhood safe. This is hard. And I, and, you know, she was like, I am conflicted. And... I want to make sure that for her and for the other kids who may feel that way as well, you know, or for the kids whose parents are cops, of which we have a bunch in, in SLA, that we are creating a space that can be nuanced, that can be respectful, that can recognize that, um, you know, not in the way of, you know, not in the way of we don't have all the facts or, you know, whatever that comment was. I'm glad that principal jumped on that, but that... More to the point, when kids are saying, you know, I am conflicted about the role of police because on one level I fear that they overreact, but I also know in my neighborhood I'm glad when I see him roll down the street, you know, or I worry that my dad, who's a cop, you know, has been shot at. I worry this, I worry that, that, that you can create the respectful space for kids to hear one another in that. But I think, though, that's like a very, very powerful like point, do, do, I think it was it was. I'm gonna say Joe, not Joanna. But when she was bringing up the different lenses, yeah. like how 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 powerful of a way to to educate kids as to even if you don't agree with the perspective, you are able to put on a different hat and actually not just look at it from that perspective, but actually analyze what you're looking at from that perspective. Like to go right. deeper 
from an entirely different mindset than you hold. And, and I think that is such a powerful skill because one thing that we know kids will do is they're going to perpetuate things as they learn how to do them. So when those kids go and have conversations about multiple things outside of, they, they will always know how to uh, listen to a person, understand their perspective, and actually analyze something from a perspective that they don't personally hold. And I think that is truly what we need the, the, the future leaders of this planet to actually be able to do sincerely. You know, Al, Al could, I just wanted to make, while I was still talking, to address the fifth grade. You're a fifth grade teacher. You've been in, right. you've been in class for a few weeks with your students. Right. This so is, so this what's, what's your answer to Joe's okay. question? I can, I can do this with seniors. Can you do it with fifth graders? Okay, okay. This is, this, this is how I do it. If, if any of my kids are listening, it's past your bedtime. So, shh. Okay. <laughs> this is what I do, right? I, I figure out, like, for example, the first unit that we're t teaching in social studies is Native Americans, right? And so, basically, I, I started the lesson with asking them, could I go to the local mall here and put my flag down and discover it? And all of them told me, no, you can't discover it. Right? I said, well, could I go to the high school and put my flag down and discover it? It was like, no, if people there, somebody owns it. I said, well, who discovered America? Christopher Columbus. How? There were people here. But instantly, when they see they've contradicted themselves, they are understanding that there was a culture that existed that was ignored. Right? So I'm starting a conversation with how people of certain uh, persuasions or power disrespect or ignore the importance of culture. And so instantly that becomes whatever you want it to be, right? Because there is a culture of police. There is a culture of a neighborhood. There is a culture of disadvantage. And certain cultures of power consistently ignore the importance of others. And, and that's kind of the recurring theme. And when they look at it that abstract, when, when, when a Ferguson or when anything comes up, I can speak about it in terms of a, a historical trend, so to speak, and not just one thing that happened. So what, what, what I'm trying to do is figure out how we can place it into other things that have nothing to do with Ferguson or so they think. Um, you know, I, I, this whole idea of um, from multiple perspectives, if I may real quick, I think, I think what, what's also important and, and, and what I'm going to be doing with my students when the school year starts here in a couple of weeks is, you know, to really bring that idea of restoring the humanity of people who are in, who are in Ferguson um, and making that visible also requires a set of really practical and tangible things to do um, like and you know like I was thinking through this and I'm like one of the most powerful things I, I've always found in these kind of cases is to write letters to folks who are in, who are in Ferguson right? right and with different standpoints so you're writing a letter to Michael Brown's family you're writing a letter as Michael Brown, you're writing a letter to the police department. You're writing a letter to the president. You're writing a, so so you 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 have this student who's writing to these people, but then also writing from the perspective of those people. Because sometimes when you want to really expand young people's mindsets and even adults' mindsets, you a lot the, the teaching task is to write a letter from the perspective of uh you know a police officer who is at Ferguson, maybe not in the shooting itself, but who's there in the riots, right. who, has a, who has a family and who has to interact in that space. Write something from his perspective. Allows you to step out of yourself for a moment and be reflective on that person's experience. And then a person who has their own deep perception about the students to write from the perspective of somebody from that community who's dealing with those issues. And so you know, the way that you build those lenses is by giving kids really tangible um, opportunities to really step into the feet of people. Um, and another thing that I, you know, that I wrote about in the little Huffington Post piece was, you know, really having kids engage in an activity where they are writing or creating memorials of sorts, maybe not to Michael Brown per se, but to other people who have had those experiences. Like, you know, one, you go to any hood USA, um, and again, and this is a whole other point, because I think the way that you talk about these issues in a majority white school and a majority African-American, Latino, Latina school is very, very different. Um, and we haven't even talked about that yet. You know, like, how do you introduce these issues to a school from youth who are from maybe socioeconomically advantaged backgrounds who believe that this has nothing to do with them at all and, frankly, you know, don't give a F about what's going on in Ferguson or Mike Brown versus a kid who's seeing himself as Michael Brown and is fearful of getting shot. 
the way you teach those two populations is very, very different. In each instance, though, one teaching task is to try to restore humanity by allowing people to step in the, into the feet of other folks. And the real challenge, off, yeah, and I think that's amazing, and I think the other huge challenge is what do you do when all those kids are in the same classroom, right? right. I mean, SLA is, you know, SLA is 50% economically disadvantaged as defined by free and reduced lunch. It is 60% uh, students of color um, and it is every zip code in Philadelphia. So we have all of that in one space and completing right. that is, uh, you know, now that, that if you do it, if you create a respectful space, Right. That becomes a, a massive strength, right? That becomes, right. oh my gosh, empathy, listening, you know, cross-cultural experiences, learning to understand the other, learning to understand the world outside your own brain. Um, but you have to be amazingly intentional to prevent people um, across all of those different demographics, however you want to define the myriad demographics we have, to prevent them from shutting down and, and, and losing the ability to hear. And we work very hard at making sure that we can always hear one another or mostly hear one another. I think yeah. this is like a major right. issue with, sorry, right. I think this is just a big issue with culturally responsive teaching in general. Right. Um, right. I think to actually address all the cultures in a classroom is right. not to say just a minority culture or just one particular minority culture or just the one that you happen to know about. Right. So I think that this goes back to um, somebody's point a long time ago about how this should not just be a conversation that lasts one week or one right. class period. This is culturally responsive teaching for the whole year and I think that to actually be culturally responsive means to know where your kids are from what they're interested in, what culture they identify with versus what culture they're actually from. I mean, it could be right. two different things. Um, and it just means to be sensitive and aware and then to do your do your research and to be so fully prepared and planned out. I mean, that's very challenging as a teacher. And I think that's part of the hardest part for the Ferguson issue is that this is at the very beginning of the school year. So you don't right. know how to be culturally responsive to your students yet because you don't know your students. So I think that right. that's a big challenge for the rest of our school year is to tie in this you know amazing and horrifying current event into your entire curriculum for the rest of the year as you get to know your students those conversations should be more and more complicated because you should get to know more and more of your students and their backgrounds and then respond to it accordingly I would um, uh, love that everyone's love making their last comments here by the way um, <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. just yeah, yeah. And if anybody has to leave right away, we really appreciate your coming. But if you want to keep talking, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, uh, Miss Rogers, um, I was I'm, I'm, I love the culturally responsive teaching. I think um, there's what I'm interested in is uh, being being young, and this is sort of like my second year in the classroom. What how learning how to facilitate culturally responsive conversation? Where 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 is that at? That wasn't necessarily in my team. <laughs> was it, um, I don't I can't name a resource you know, there's, there's no teach like a culturally responsive champion I guess uh, I'm gonna send you like well let's exchange information because I'm, I'm gonna send some <laughs> yeah. stuff um, on reality pedagogy which essentially is these tangible practical things for teachers to be able to do to be able wow. to get into that and um and like let's just let's just talk because those those resources do exist uh, they're not as prominent, right. uh, but shoot, I, I wrote some stuff, man. I'll send it your way. <laughs> yes, and you I have to it. look for it for sure. You have, I mean, it's not in your face, and you, but yeah. once you find it, then it's there. But then I think, I mean, from like a, even when you're overwhelmed as a new teacher kind of spot where you're like, I know I should be doing this, but I have no idea how. Right. I mean, it always comes back to kids and relationships and building the relationship and knowing your kids and then figuring out where you need to go from there. And that's where all those resources then come into play. Right. And I would say that um, the work of Nell Noddings and her ethic of care mm -hmm. and how to create a caring environment and, and a caring classroom, um, she is, for me, the godmother of thinking <laughs> this way. Um, so pick up Educating Moral People or Caring, uh, a Challenge to Care, uh, a, challenge to, a Feminist Approach to Education, um, any any of Nell Nell Notting's stuff is 
is the stuff you don't you don't walk away from. Or Bell Hooks teaching to transgress is the other one that that you 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 read that book and you you're not allowed to think about the classroom the same way anymore. It's it's those are like the transformative ones that that kind of will put you on that kind of path. All right, I I think there's a pause there, and I'm going to jump in and say we should give each other a break and. Um, Thank you all. Um, but if anybody wants to have a final thought here, jump in. Um, <laughs> no? Thank you. Okay, so um, we are here every Wednesday night, and we will continue conversations like this and other conversations around these issues every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and uh, we are a um, broadcast on the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network and um, come back soon. Deborah, thank you so much from, for coming and those the rest of you yours, and others here who joined us as well. Thank you so much um, and please come back. Thank you. you. Know I'm sorry. My, Go my, ahead. my friends would kill me. If I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. Please, yeah. Uh, yeah. Every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern we have our Hip Hop Ed Chat. It's hashtag yeah. H-I-P-H-O-P-E-D and we have conversations about the intersections of hip hop, hip hop culture, and education, and have these kind of conversations about about race, class, ethnicity, youth culture, urbanness, African American youth, Latino Latino youth, and education every Tuesday at 9 p.m. So well, um, join throw us. You, so throw your TV away, you know. That's <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't need TV on Tuesday nights. You got hip hop. I got your back. Or Wednesday. Right. Yeah, right. right. But so, what, what's the URL again? There. So it's, it's it's on Twitter, and our hashtag yeah. is hip hop ed. So H I P. H O P E D. Uh, we throw out a topic a couple of hours beforehand, um, and we have the best minds and brains, teachers, educators, students, professors, all just having really powerful conversations about hip hop culture and youth culture and education. Cool. And Al, yeah. go ahead. Monday's Eve discussion. Uh, I call it the Monday's Eve discussion because we all have it on a Sunday, which is okay. Monday's Eve. Uh, the next one will be October 26th. Actually, the topic will be. Popular hashtags on Twitter and how educators can use Twitter. Uh, we would love to have some people from the Hip Hop Ed hashtag on. So if your schedule is free, Dr. Evans, please I got join. You, bro. I got uh, you. <laughs> okay, but yeah, but it's just a Google Plus Hangout. I'm trying to do like one every uh, quarter. So that'll be the next one. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you. Uh, we'll see you all soon. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank Good you all. all right. Peace. Thanks. He's out.